Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode of Autism Stories, I'm pleased to be joined by Lucy Aiken, who joins me to discuss the impact of sharing your truth, being a performer in many genres, and creating a one-woman show. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Lucy, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. I wanted to just start off and learn, like we do with so many of our, our guests, where does your story in the autistic community sort of begin? That's a great question. So I guess there's a short and a long answer to this. The short answer would be that I learned that I was on the autism spectrum. Specifically, I was diagnosed with a nonverbal learning disability when I was 19 years old, although I do consider myself to also be like... I guess a self-diagnosed, it, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not like NVLD is part of the autism spectrum, although it seems to be that the consensus is that it is. So I use a lot of terms like neurodivergent on the spectrum, like ASPE. I kind of use those terms all interchangeably as sort of one collective. My aunt works in special education. I believe she calls herself an educational specialist because she said that sometimes the term like special ed can be a bit pejorative and kind of come with an unfortunate stigma. And she, I guess, was the one that had suggested to my parents that I get tested. She said that she saw signs that I might be on the spectrum as early as the age of about two. However, for a variety of reasons, I didn't actually get tested until the age of 19. But I think that there were other people and also my father who, that it took a while to actually get the official diagnosis. So yeah, that's my story. Now, I enjoy a, a good mantra as I think it can help <laughs> uh, give a meaningful structure to, to our lives. So I read that your sure. mantra is to train like an athlete, think like an entrepreneur, and perform like it's your <laughs> destiny. So I definitely, definitely want to learn more about that and wondering how that, that mantra gives structure to you in your life. Oh my goodness. Okay. Do you want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> Let, let's go with the long answer. It's a podcast. Let's go for it. Sure. Okay. I'll talk your ear off. <laughs> so way back, so my lifelong special interest, uh, one of them has been musical. I minored in musical theater as well. When I was about 17 years old, I did a master class with this amazing performer. Her name is Sierra Boggess. I don't know if you've heard of her. She was the original Ariel in Little Mermaid. She played Christine Daae in Phantom of the Opera, all these big time roles. And I remember that she told us her mantra was, you are enough. You are so enough. It is unbelievable how enough you are. And I remember at the age of 17, like, wow, I love that she has a mantra. And it was like her tagline on her Instagram and her website and everything. And I was like, you know what? I think as an artist, I need a mantra. <laughs> so I decided, I thought about it a lot. I was like, what's my mantra? And when I made my website, I just decided that I was going to put it on the website. And actually, it's funny because there were some people who told me, like, I, have a, I had a college friend that was like, Lucy, this mantra is really cheesy. Like, maybe you should take this off. And it's, it's a little bit unprofessional. It's too, like, childlike. But I was like, no, but it feels like me. And then I had another friend that was like, it is cheesy, but you're also kind of a cheesy person. So you might as well keep it on there. So I guess it's about, like, to be... A performer or really to be good at anything I think you have to have the discipline of an athlete but you also have to have the kind of savviness of an entrepreneur and perform like it's your destiny just means kind of embrace what you feel you were put on this earth to do and you know be your most self-actualized self <laughs> well apparently I like cheesy because I, I love that, that mantra uh, now, often the world tells us we need to specialize in one thing or we, sh you know, or shouldn't do this or we shouldn't do that. However, I know you're a, you're a singer, a dancer, a writer, comedian, and entrepreneur. 
So you do a lot of different things, and I'm wondering how learning these different things and getting better at each of them has shaped your life in a way that would have been different if you hadn't had just concentrated on one thing? That is a great question. Within the arts, being a sort of triple threat, particularly in the musical theater realm where I originally came from, is sort of the norm. And triple threat means being able to act, sing, and dance in equal measure. Although because of the demands of musicals in recent years, things like being able to play the piano or do puppetry like in Avenue Q or do circus arts like in Pippin. Like there's all these skills that are expected of performers beyond just the traditional acting, singing, and dancing. But I think even broader than that, being what we would call a multi-hyphenate, so sort of a creative professional that has a bunch of feed into each other, I think is more and more becoming the norm for artists. So it's hard to say how my life would have been different because I'm not sure that I could do what I have done if I was only focusing on one thing. And I think for me, I realized early on that I was, like I said when I was 21 in an application for something and I'm like a jack of all trades, but within a very narrow niche. I guess I would say now that as I've gotten older, I've realized some people I think are born to be hyper specialists. My interests are actually fairly limited. They're really the arts neurodiversity advocacy and writing like that's pretty those are the main things that I spend my time thinking about (laughs) however I guess being sort of a multi-hyphenate is actually kind of the norm in this day and age and I think within the entertainment industry like actors who are also content creators who maybe also write or own their own online merch store like that sort of symbiosis is it's almost like the norm not the exception in this day and age I guess maybe I would be more the range of opportunities I've been given if I only had a very limited set of skills, I guess, for lack of a better word. So, yeah. From what I understand, you, this year, you're going to be having a one woman show. I love one person shows. I think they're really cool. (laughs) So can you tell me what yours is about? Yes. Thank you for asking that. It is still in development. There is a working title, but I am going to refrain from saying it because as they always say, you don't want to show all your cards to The premise is that it is about my experiences dating as a woman on the verge of the autism spectrum and sort of the trials and tribulations of that. But it's told in a sort of variety show style way with some fun surprises. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you've performed a lot professionally. I know you've traveled all over the world from Alaska to Turkey, I believe. So for someone like me that gets very nervous flying and has never been to a different country by himself, I'm really interested. What have you done to, I don't know, maybe you you weren't overwhelmed traveling by yourself. Been that experience for you like? It's hard to say because I guess I've been lucky in that I have traveled a lot internationally at a pretty young age. And I want to acknowledge that there is a tremendous amount of privilege in being able to do that. You know, many people never get the opportunity or resources to. So I just want to acknowledge that I am extraordinarily lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had. With that being said, the first time I went out of the country was actually when I was a baby. My parents are both professional dancers and my mother was performing in Denmark. She decided to kind of ignore the doctor's advices about like taking a maternity leave. And so she just kind of dove into her like dance career very quickly after having me. And then I would also go with my parents all over the country for performance gigs growing up as a kid. So I think that because I was exposed to it at such an early age, that might be part of why. I think also, you know, as neurodivergent people, we all have different elements where we feel like we are our best self and we're vibing and we're flowing and then elements where we don't. For me, like, I always joke, like, (laughs) the airport feels like a runway or something. Like, I love... I wouldn't say I love airports, but like kind of, yeah, I don't know. For me, I I get a lot of joy out of travel. So I guess it's like, I don't mind it as much. And I, I don't necessarily, I have a hard time understanding like why some people get so anxious flying. Cause for me, I'm just like, oh, that's no big deal. But I, there are other things that, that regular people find extremely pedestrian, like getting in an elevator that terrifies me because I'm afraid of getting stuck in it. So I guess as far as tips, There's a great sort of actor TV personality, and I saw a TikTok that she did where she talked about 
like going up to the ticket counter and saying that she has autism and being able to get accommodations for the flight. So I guess that is an option. There's also like lanyards that you can get apparently that are orange lanyards that indicate that you have a disability. For all of my uh, neurodivergent fam that is looking to travel, I will say I think that the issue of like, I don't necessarily have the answer. I think for me, it was sort of one of the things that appealed to me about travel is that I could, I didn't have to be the girl on the spectrum, I could just be the American. And so I actually liked the anonymity about traveling and kind of flying under the radar. But I think if you need accommodations when flying and when traveling, they do exist. Unfortunately, I don't have enough personal knowledge and experience to be able to say exactly what those are. But I know times people that work at airports that can do things like escort you to your gate or assist you with getting on and off the flight so I guess just sort of maybe do some research to see what's out there and if there are like autism travel groups or whatever I guess that's also a a good option but I do think practice makes perfect and I think the more that you do it the less scary it gets Mm -hmm. you were talking about your one woman show earlier and I'm wondering how it relates to a wonderful article that you wrote not too long ago that I think many of our listeners could very much relate to, and it's called Unsuccessfully Seducing a Weed Farmer, the Diary of a (laughs) Neurotypical Passing Woman's Dating Life. And you mentioned on social media that sharing your truth with the world kind of took a long time for you. So what's in your experience or the feedback you've received since um, sharing this article? I had some people tell me that I was brave for sharing it. There's a part of me that earnestly takes it as a compliment now there's the other part of me that hears my grandmother's voice in the back of my head and I, she's not with us anymore but she would be like there are people risking their lives for our freedom so let's just all dial this down with calling my granddaughter brave here <laughs> like i hear her voice in my head i would love to live in a world where like it doesn't have to be so brave to just share your truth Like, I don't think we would call a neurotypical woman brave for writing an article about her personal life. Women and men are doing that every hour of every day as we speak right now. There are probably billions of those types of articles and listicles that are being circulated. You know, like on Thought Catalog, there's like 10 ways to win over a guy or whatever. Like, no, you're doing dating wrong. You know, we don't think of them as brave. We just think of that this is life. With that being said, it's it's been very positive. I I haven't gotten any... uh, negative feedback yet I guess part of the reason that I was nervous to share my truth is that like most of what I'd done for my life was pretending to be other people as opposed to sharing my own story but also just to be online it's very easy to misperceive other people or misconstrue their intentions which I think is part of why just being honest like the dialogue around autism and neurodiversity has gotten so incredibly heated and contentious because it's easy to assume the worst in somebody when you don't have the, you can't see their body language or you can't, you know, feel their energy in the room or whatever. When I say see their body language, I I don't mean that like in an ableist way. I just mean like physically being present in the space. So I think honestly, part of it is that I we're self-serving or whatever, because I think about this all the time. Like I'm fully cognizant of the fact that there is always two sides to every story. And like, if this gentleman (laughs) felt compelled to write an article about me, you would get an entirely different narrative. So yeah, just worrying about like what people would think, but also just, is this too personal? Is it too lewd? Is it too shocking to share with the world? Like, will I be seen as unprofessional if I share it? You know, I think all of those things were part of why it took me three years. Cause this happened when I was 23 and I'm 26 now, I'm almost 27. So it was three, almost four years ago. Great question. Yeah. I love all the things that us as autistics we have in common, but I'm also fascinated by our differences as well. And one thing that can definitely be a difference is our sensory differences. So I read uh, where you said that there's a certain kind of girl that gets iced coffee in the dead of winter (laughs) in Boston. And so I need an explanation because I'm the exact opposite where if it's like 90 degrees during the summer, uh, I'm going to go for the hottest (laughs) cup of coffee still. So tell me about this. (laughs) You know, so I feel like I don't have sensory differences, I think, to the extent that many neurodiverse people have. I do in some ways, but I think that mine are more like minor on that scale. 
I just, I like the taste of iced coffee, I guess. Yeah. I just, I like that it lasts longer, I feel like, whereas hot coffee, you have to like keep reheating it once it gets past a certain point. Although I will say it depends like where you go, certainly. Post originated because I do this thing called Late Night Thoughts with Lucy, where I, it's basically just me like blathering on about nothing. Like it's just my random thoughts that pop into my head. But really what it is, is that I started it as a way to test out jokes on the internet and (laughs) see if anything lands. And truthfully, (laughs) yeah, a lot of the not everything lands but it's like the analogy of you have to kick the ball in the net a thousand times before you score a goal type thing so yeah that really more was about just kind of sharing my viewpoint and then when i get jokes that land i often will use them in stand-up sets Mm. so that's kind of the story behind that (laughs) one thing that you just mentioned about reheating coffee i don't know how much of my life has been wasted by reheated coffee, and I don't want to. <laughs> I definitely don't want to tell our my, the listeners of this podcast how often I reheat my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, actually really funny. Yeah. Well, but if it makes you happy, then it's worth it. Yeah, you know? like I I feel like I need to like burn my tongue every day, you know, for for whatever reason. <laughs> and I can see both sides of it. I think also like depending on going circling back to travel, like. There are some places in the world that make hot coffee really well. Like, I feel like if I were in Italy right now, I'd love to get, like, a hot cappuccino. When I was in Turkey, actually, Turkish coffee, which is hot usually, is quite good. So I can see how it kind of depends what type of hot coffee you're going for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Lucy, yeah. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for making time for me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much to Lucy for the conversation. To learn more about Lucy, please check out the link in the podcast description of this episode. At Autism Personal Coach, we provide customized coaching for autistics. All of our coaches are either autistic or autistic selected for their commitment to trauma-informed and neurodiversity-affirming strategies. They deeply understand burnout, sensory needs, executive functioning, and the importance of special interests. If you're interested in learning more about our coaching, please visit autismpersonalcoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.